Lane Community College presents the Lane Peace and Democracy Conference. And, and can you really succeed in war in, in the first place? You know, is, that, is there such a thing as winning a war? We have now surpassed, surpassed the military budgets of the rest of the world combined. The world can no longer entertain the delusion that the U.S. standard of living is possible for the entire planet. I've tried the kumbaya, and we're all the same, and you know, that, that doesn't work anymore. Just as war is too important to leave to the generals, civil liberties is too important to leave to the lawyers. Women are standing up in these prestigious positions, and it's time. We live in a society that is unequal, that is unjust, that is full of oppression and, and racism. We need to commit to removal of all our forces. And a favorite law enforcement tactic is to disturb a hive and then listen for the buzz. You do not clear cut forests to make toilet paper. And then the riot police came in and told us, okay, everyone needs to stand in the sidewalk unless you want to get pepper sprayed or arrested. And the Peace Center will be an important element in making a difference for ourselves, our community, and in time, the world. And that all rights are equally important. Uh, the right not to be tortured or the right to vote is as important as the right to shelter and the right to food. The biggest threat to humanity, it does come down to massive death. Pepper spraying and shooting uh, automatic rubber bullets into the crowd, so it, was, it sounded like machine gun, and everyone was pretty scared. And our country has one out of every hundred of our people in jail. The world economic system is destabilizing. Terrorist acts are better treated as criminal acts with political implications rather than as an act of war. The need to teach peace is obvious. The need to teach people other values besides war is obvious. And if we leave it to a political party and a leader to decide whether they bring those troops home, they're not coming home. In the ancient world, um, there are two kinds of black people. One in Africa, and those are the people of Kush, because that was one of the ancient names of Africa, and two in Sindh, which is now what we call India, Pakistan. And so you have, for example, yoga in both places. So on the pyramids, there's yoga postures inscribed in the pyramids. So those of you who are familiar with yoga, if you know your sun salutations in Egypt, they're referred to as Ra's journey through the skies. So the floor work, where you start with cobra and stuff like that, basically the idea is that Ra, the sun god, travels through the sky and then gets eaten by the sky goddess and then dies. And then he travels through the underworld and then is reborn in the morning. Right. So the sun salutations is Ra rising in the morning, being reborn. And then when you get to the floor work, he's dying and making his way through the underworld and coming back. In India, they refer to sun salutations as Surya Namaskar, salutation to the sun. So there's been a relationship between Africa and India that basically predates Western civilization for a long time. So when we look at the cultural interchange between those groups, they're ancient enough so that there are a lot of concepts that get translated. So in India, the, in the yoga systems, you're basically moving energy called prana. In Egypt, it's called rao, and it's the same thing, basically. Like the Chinese call it chi, Japanese call it ki, Hawaiians call it mana, you know, Judaism, they call it, uh, let's see, lahayim, life. In Islam, it's baraka, et cetera, et cetera. Native Americans would refer to it as medicine, basically the same thing. So today, when we're talking about satyagraha, there's a reason why that movement was basically 
chosen or that concept was chosen early on in the 1900s by African Americans as a strategy to work with America. So just to bring it into a more contemporary thing, I'm going to play a clip from um, uh, called 9-11, which is with Cornell West, and it's from a CD called Never Forget uh, Remembrance, and, and it's by Cornell West and Black Men Who Mean Business. And so this is called 9-11. There's no doubt that 9-11 is a turning point, a pivotal moment in the history of this nation, in the history of this empire. And then there's a 12-minute discussion between Tavis Smiley, Cornell West, and Michael Eric Dyson on the N-word. <laughs> Killer. We're not going to get into it now. Not entirely germane, but it is partially. So, Satyagraha is the, the uh, word in Sanskrit uh, from which Martin Luther King got the concept of soul power when he was basically talking about nonviolent social change. Uh, and so one of the things, if you understand, besides my quote with Jimi Hendrix, the power of soul, anything is possible, uh, no justice, no peace. So what justice means is not necessarily what comes from the legal system, <clears throat> but to start, uh, one, one of the things that Gandhi talked about, what Satyagraha literally means, is to hold on to truth and to speak it. 
and usually to speak an uncomfortable truth, and that generally generates heat. And in the heat of that discussion, well, not only do people get hot, but sometimes with that heat, you shed light on a situation. And so that's one of the things that they talk about in the ensuing discussion about nigger and the use of the word. It's like, yeah, we are generating heat with it, but there is some light. And so we, again, refine that light to illumine what's going on in, in society, what you've done with the least of these in terms of looking at social movements. So when basically when Cornell is saying to be a nigger in America is, is to be unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence and hated, and to the degree that continues on and to the degree that uh, that can be applied to anyone at any time, who do you value less and what happens to them? And then what, again, are the structures that basically create those things happening and re repetitive going on, you know, whatever, whatever those things are. So to look at what social justice means, if you're going to talk about satyagrahic national security, I decided to start with the end of the talk first. Okay? What would national security mean? in a satyagrahic sense. So national security would mean every human being is a relative and a citizen. So basically we go with the rules the way it was before 1492. We're talking about here in America. Because before 1492, there are a number of native nations that were aware of what I would call, refer to in a later slide as what I call in English the people of the four directions. That is, the people of the east, the yellow race, the people of the south, the black race, the people of the west, the red race, and the people of the north, the white race. So within that configuration, north is not superior to south, east is not superior to west. They're simply directions that have a part of the truth. They're the same people. They just have different ways of knowing creator. Creator didn't just make Indian people, it didn't just make black people, it made all of us. And we're the same folks. Biologically, there's only one race, the human race. And we know that because whenever we mix, we create viable offspring that are not mules, that are not ligers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm basically talking about sterile critters that, you know, you can mix species somewhat. There is some DNA compatibility, but the offspring themselves aren't viable. All right, and so there's some interesting things that happen when the people of the four directions mix. So, if you look, p apply Saudi Graha to this context here in Turtle Island, then there, well, wait a minute, before 1492, there weren't no borders. The people of, you know, if you're like Lakota or you're Six Nations, basically you had a trading relationship with the red cities of the south, that is, the pyramid cities. Tenochtitlan, and you know, around the Aztec country, and also the Olmecs. And the Olmecs themselves basically is a mixture of African people and native people. Okay? Native people were building pyramids before Africans got here. Okay? But we did offer some technical assistance, and after that technical assistance, basically native pyramids started aligning on a north-south axis, and you started seeing some other features. Like around 850 BC. Okay, so about 800 years after Christ, there was tales among the native people of this pale guy they called the good white brother who spread a message of peace, did healings. This is 800 years after Jesus died. And he said he'd be coming back. And so they were, you know, they knew about white people before Columbus. They did. They were expecting the return of the good white brother, which is why when the Taino encountered Cristobal Colon on Guanahani Island, October 12, 1492, they were bringing gifts. Oh, cool, white people, the good white brother. We'll miss in, you know, same thing with Pizarro, same thing with Cortez. 
So they knew about white people before. And so even the Taino who you know, met Cristobal Colon said, you know, he gave them, uh, among the gifts were these gold spear points they called guanin, which we now call that material 14 karat gold. And Columbus goes, where'd you get this stuff? And they said, south across the water, these black guys had it. He goes back to Portugal in the second voyage and shows the king of Portugal the spear points. Oh, guanin. Columbus, how do you know? It's from Ghana. Yeah, Africans have been going, well, no, going across there for, they've had secret trade routes for a while. No, no, I'm the first. Wrong, Chris. So, no borders. If you're here, you're coming to this country, you're contributing positively, you're a citizen the way it was. Okay? Africans didn't come here to make slaves. They didn't come here for land. Africa's bigger than North America. We brought our own gold. Okay, so there's a relationship possible that's not based on superiority of one race over another. So every human being a relative and a citizen. Every human being, this is national security, clothed, fed, sheltered, educated to the level necessary to be a spiritually, culturally, politically, economically, creatively, and viable contributor to society. That means you don't destroy the schools and you teach everybody's history, and you teach the ways to get around and together. You, so you teach everybody's history going back a millennia so that you understand everybody's history. So humans live also in such a way to not cause the extinction of biosphere critical species. Another piece. Humans live in such a way that the same resources available now are available to the seventh human generation from now. In other words, 140 years. So you don't do clear cuts. By the way, if you look at the societies that live, that continue beyond, uh, let's say, 3,000 years, nobody makes paper from trees. Nobody. Egypt Egyptians use papyrus. That's where our word paper comes from. It's a reed, renewable resource. Chinese use rice paper. You do cut down trees to make ships, to make houses. You do not clear cut forests to make toilet paper. Okay? You act as if <laughs> this is not our resource. This is <laughs> the future's resource, and you do sustainable as part of your process, right? Satyagraha, justice. So and a lot of people don't, have not heard of Emmett Till. But basically, uh, however you tell, however you tell the story, there's a reason. Basically, the civil rights movement was actually going to use Emmett Till because this incident occurred before the Montgomery bus, before Rosa Parks. But they thought that this would be a difficult issue to make an issue, even though it was ongoing. But to think that, OK, you kill a 14-year-old kid because allegedly he whistles at a, well, he, his cousins did say he did whistle at this white woman. But I mean, what kind of game does a 14-year-old have with a 21-year-old woman, really, please? No. And then, you know, three days later, you drag him out of bed and then, you know, sh you know beat him up, shoot him through the head, then put him in a river. And then when they find the body, his mom gets death threats because they were, the sheriff was burying the body without an autopsy or anything in Mississippi, in Mississippi. She got death threats for wanting the body exhumed. The governor of Illinois had to call the governor of Mississippi to get the body back. And then she decides she's going to have, as Cornell talked about, an open casket funeral, because when she was going to the funeral home, she could smell the body from three blocks away. Death threats for having an open casket funeral and the press of the world showing his photograph like that. 
Now, this is a caution for, you know, I'm 53, so this was a cautionary tale for black men my age about, especially when we started integrating white schools. So, lynching continues. So, from the president's former state, the men who killed James Byrd were the first white men sentenced to death for killing a black man since slavery in Texas. Notice it doesn't say killing a black, not, no, well, actually you don't get sentenced to, kick for death, to death for killing a black man. Actually, if we look at death penalty statistics nationwide, the race of the victim determines the sentence. The only time white people get sentenced to death for killing people of color is if the person of color is a cop. Otherwise, they get life or less than life. So when we talk about justice and the justice system, our, all lives are not weighted the same way. So the white man who killed a slave was not convicted of the murder of a human being, but destroying someone else's property. And of course, the slave owner in Texas would have been within his rights to kill the slave. So it's basically like, you know, it's Texas, so it's like a horse thief. So when we look at historical justice, so basically James Byrd was dragged to death behind a vehicle using that chain till his body fell apart. He was alive dragged by his feet, actually. Okay, this is in the late 90s. So the reason we bring up this kind of stuff is because usually the effect of segregation silences us. We don't tell the truth. There's no point in telling the truth because people don't believe it. I've had this experience too when I was asked once to do a diversity training for a local treatment agency which shall remain unnamed at the moment but in negotiating with it, you know, I basically said, okay, sometimes you have to understand the hidden history of a population. So, you know, if you're in a treatment group and one of the white therapists uses the term tar baby and a black woman from Kentucky says, you shouldn't use that word because it's like offensive to black people. You know, that was when being black was an insult. So tar baby, you know, well, uh, and he used it again even after she asked him not to, and so, well, y'all need some diversity training up here. So the guy defended the use of the term tar baby because the dictionary said that it was an emotionally sticky situation. Well, who wrote the dictionary? <laughs> and have you not heard of Toni Morrison, tar baby? So, you know, in bringing up that incident, well, I didn't refer specifically to that incident because that's why the person wanted me to do the training someone who knew the history, I mentioned Emmett Till, and the secretary said that didn't happen. I'm making it up. There's a PBS movie on, like, next week. The true story of Emmett Till. I'm making it up? Wow. Ironically, her name was, or is probably still, Shanti. Okay, no justice, no peace. Your ignorance is causing a conflict. Basic ignorance of, you know, what should we know about each other to have justice? So the question is how to practically change racist and why racist has a star is that it's not just racist. In fact, if we use the, the uh, Remy Callilang, who's a multicultural coordinator for Bethel and I, came up with a construct because we said, okay, we're tired of just doing racism because there's actually an interlocking system of oppressions about differences. Okay, so we use the acronym CRASH. So that is C R A cubed S H. So C is classism, R is racism, the three A's ability, like is in disability, age and addiction, okay? Because there are addictions of all kinds that people experience discrimination. Why do we think alcoholics are better than junkies? Just because their drug is legal? They kill more people. <laughs> who's more dangerous? And who's more prevalent? Hmm, 
People get discriminated. How are, how are white junkies better than black junkies? How are white alcohol, you know, the people who, according to Ronald Reagan, when Ronald Reagan is saying just say no, and this basic the statistic has remained pretty much the same, that when Ronald Reagan first said just say no, 80% of the illegal drug users were white men who made in excess of $50,000. Okay, so that figure has never gone below 70%. Okay, so during that 80% time, illegal black drug users were 4% of the drug users in the country. Guess who's doing time? Not because the rich white guys can afford better lawyers. Okay, no justice, no peace. Okay, who's driving the illegal drug trade? It isn't poor black crack addicts. Okay, it's like people in Congress. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> Delete that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. The question is how to practically change racist America. So as early as W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the things that impressed Du Bois <clears throat> about Gandhi, because Gandhi was basically doing what he was doing in South Africa, and basically the connection between South Africa and America has never been more clear in terms of a racist past and <laughs> sanctioned discrimination, government sanctioned discrimination. Okay, so how do you, you know, fight that nonviolently if you don't have the strength of arms to basically have a violent revolution and obviously that ain't gonna work. So how did Gandhi achieve that? Because some of his ideas were impressive to Du Bois, who was a genius, and he said, okay, let's bring him here. Except the problem was bringing Gandhi to New York in the 1900s meant that Gandhi could only stay in Harlem because no New York, the finest New York hotels wouldn't accept a non-white person within, you know, <laughs> sleeping within their bed. So he decided, well, maybe he shouldn't come, but Gandhi sent a message anyway, and Du Bois published it. So as early as Du Bois, there's a civil rights movement where African Americans are like, okay, we like some of your ideas, how do we implement this in America? So it doesn't just start with King. I mean, there's a, a, a clear threat going back some time. So again, America is not just simply racist, but also anthropocentric, classes, sexist, heterosexist, etc. So the problem Du Bois felt was how to bring a proponent of nonviolent change to America. So when we talk about the four races, you know, four races being one race, there's power and definition. And so each race has its own visible world and invisible world that generates their culture. The visible world is what their behavior is that you can see. The invisible world is the motivations behind that that are invisible. So in order to arrive at a complete understanding, you have to understand both of them. So Star Wars analogy. Now most people, you're not, probably not into Star Wars, so whatever. I thought I had to give an example by saying, okay, so most of y'all are familiar with Martin Luther King, okay? So I'm gonna say that Martin Luther King is like Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay, in Star Wars, because you're familiar with that, okay? So, who's Obi-Wan Kenobi's teacher? Qui-Gon Jinn, okay? So, Qui-Gon Jinn, in this analogy, is Bayard Rustin, okay? Because Bayard, black, gay, Quaker, hooked up with Howard Thurman, who becomes Yoda in this analogy. And Yoda, okay? teacher of Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda has a teacher. So most people, of course, in the Star Wars, you know, uh, sep let's see, sextology, sex, quint, sex, yeah, sextology, okay, we start with, you know, the first one where you see Yoda. We don't see Yoda's teacher. Yoda's like 900 years old by the time we get to the end of the trilogy, you know, so, or the, the sep sextology. So Yoda's teacher is Gormo. Gandhi is Gormo. 
In other words, a hidden teacher in a particular lineage. So Gormo is a teacher of Yoda. Howard Thurman is Yoda. Most people haven't heard of him. But it's clear when you read his stuff and Martin's stuff who the master is and who the teacher is, who the student is, clearly. But nobody knows about Howard because he didn't lead a social movement. But Martin did his master's work at Boston College, and, Mark, and Howard was the uh, rector at Boston College. So here's what gets deep. So Howard, in his books, uh, my particular favorites are Disciplines of the Spirit and The Luminous Darkness. And he, he wrote like 16 different books. They're like pamphlet size. They're not that difficult to get, but most people haven't heard of Howard. So if you think of Howard as Yoda, the master behind the student, the hidden teacher for the public activist, okay? And you study his teachings. So there's always this thread. There's hidden history. This is why I talked about the invisible world for each of the people of the four directions. This is hidden history. It's not totally hidden. You just have to know that it's there. So Howard writes from a Christian perspective that the reason you are nonviolent is that if you kill your opponent, you forever remove the possibility that your opponent will achieve liberation in this lifetime. That sounds Buddhist. And he's even using the... Please don't take offense. I'm just speaking a difficult truth. Okay. I was raised as a Afrocentric liberation theologist. Okay, so black liberation theologists start with, well, one, his name ain't Jesus. So my grandfather was a Baptist preacher, right? He said, okay, you need to find the words of Jesus in the original language, and his name wasn't Jesus, and the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible that I preach from ain't even the original Bible. Oh, well then first, you know, I'm 10 years old when Grandpa's saying this, why don't we have a black Jesus in the church? He said, because if we had a black Jesus at Solid Rock Baptist Church in Oakland, California in 1965, white people would burn the church down because they are doing that, even in Oakland. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just keep this to yourself, right? Here's the books that prove it, okay? But he didn't have any books in Aramaic, which is the language that Yeshua spoke, okay? Yeshua, which means the supreme being, Yah, Jah, Shua, saves and restores. That's where you get Jesus saves. Jesus in Greek means healing Zeus. So it's not even... <laughs> You know, that's not the name his mama gave him. So if you're going to give him props, you least <laughs> props to a black man. Call him out. Don't call him out his name. Call him what his mama called him. But for convention, okay, from a Christian perspective, using the King James Version of the Bible as a text, because we basically are saying, okay, here's our double think. Okay, we can't use a black Jesus. We can't even use the Peshitta, which is the Bible in Aramaic. Okay, so we'll just use what people are familiar with. Okay, the book that we were, you know, for the first time, for when black people came here as slaves, we were forbidden to even not only read, but even participate in Christianity for the first 80 years that we were here. And then when we were allowed to participate in Christianity, we're given the King James Version of the Bible and a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. That is Michelangelo's uncle as the model. <laughs> That's who was, <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> I don't have to make things up. I mean, <laughs> that's it. Okay? And so, what is the image? You see, you basically have the image of Christ being changed from the historical model. I mean, if you look at the country, if the Peshitta came from, I mean, I read this in the Register Guard, so it must be true. <laughs> the oldest book in the world, in the British Museum in Cairo. The Peshitta, in Aramaic, they said that. The oldest physical book in the world is a copy of the Peshitta. The country that has practiced Christianity the longest in the world is Ethiopia. 
saw that in the African Museum and the National Mall in D.C., so it must be true, right? Okay, so, if the, you know, and if you look at the image in Ethiopia in churches, it's like he looks like me with curly hair. There are some depictions with dreadlock, depends, whatever, but curly hair works for me. So we look at why don't we have a historically accurate portrayal? Because if you have a dark-skinned Jesus, then you understand that the biblical basis for racism disappears. It's gone. White supremacy doesn't work. Because <laughs> you can't say that God cursed black people and that's why they're black, which is a value that I've heard today, even today. Okay, so all that disappears. You know, because Grandpa said, it doesn't really matter what color he was. The message still is the same. And the reason that black people resonate with the message is, it's our message. So when we talk about, from that Christian perspective, nonviolence, <clears throat> you kill your opponent, you forever remove the possibility that you will, your opponent will achieve liberation in this lifetime. That means that liberation is possible in this lifetime as long as there's life. Come on, don't do that. <laughs> As Yoda would say, fear leads to anger. <laughs> anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side. <laughs> well, you know, notice when he's saying that. He's saying that, you know, in the third episode, you know, when Anakin is freaking out that he might lose Padme, and, you know, Yoda says, Train yourself to let go of the few things you fear to lose. Because if you're afraid, then you're grasping on. You know, death is part of life. Think you will always lose something. So train yourself to let go because fear leads to anger. In the luminous darkness, <clears throat> and this is one of the things that, you know, is really hard to deal with. I really hated reading this, but... There you go. He writes about the spiritual effects of segregation on the black soul and on the white soul. Causes us to lie to whites about the pain of segregation in order to survive and to seek healing on our own. So basically, in segregation, we create a world of safety on our own that we can shield ourselves and heal ourselves from the pain of racism and discrimination. And we basically say, white people can just rot. They're crazy. <laughs> Let them be evil. And he says, no, that's wrong. The master, referring to Yeshua, or Jesus as he says, okay, wants us to love them. And it's only in Aramaic when you start getting into, you know, the phrase, Aheb la well babakun, which is the phrase that got translated into English as love your enemies. The type of love being referred to is not either agape or eros, those are Greek words, it's in Aramaic. And the phrase itself, like its other sister languages, is instructions on how to do it. So in the four Semitic languages, that is Arabic, Hebrew, Amharic, and Aramaic, a single word can mean up to 10 different things depending on who's using it when and what context and the understanding of the listener. Okay, so the simplest directions, and I'll, there's a slide that talks about loving your enemies practically, right? Because otherwise, love your enemies in the King James Version of the Bible means you think, you think, turn the other cheek. Which, no, it's not simply that. That would be easy. Yeah, let somebody beat you to death. Well, no, you don't just do that. Okay, you don't do violence to them in your heart either. Okay, so <clears throat> causes us to lie to whites about the pain of segregation in order to survive and to seek healing on our own while allowing their souls to continue to decay. Th thus, from the point of view of Satyagraha, doing violence. So doing nothing, being silent about your truth is doing violence. So even if it is a difficult truth, you have to speak it. That is one of the essences of Satyagraha, holding on to truth. Okay, so that's why in terms of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, you know, one of the things that's stereotypical about black people is like, we will definitely bring up the difficult thing. 
whatever it is. And we will be kind of like the conscience in that sense for America. As Cornell says, the blues people can teach a blues nation something. So, Sari Graha requires truth telling through connection. So, for example, you know, the old uh, gospel song, If his eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. So, it's also attention to detail and connection to the smallest thing. You have to watch out for sparrows, too. So, there's a clear thing where we're not just caring about how we deal with each other, but how we deal with the natural world, because we can see that and then also the invisible world. So, soul power is praxis. Praxis is a word which simply means that the, you have the theory of how something works and the actual practice and how they inform and change each other. So, if you go to Wikipedia and you, you know, basically Google Satyagraha and Wikipedia basically talks and gives you a whole bunch of references on what Gandhi talks about, one of the very key things is the end and the means are the same. So you can't just go take a particular course of action because it'll get you there. What's also critical is how you do it, while you do it. You cannot cause violence in any step of the way. You have to let go of violence in your truth-telling and in your being to pull off your end, a peaceful end, if your end is peace and holding on to truth. So the ends and the means are the same. What you have done, you know, as Isha would say, what you have done to the least of these, you've done to me. So soul power is connection. And as Yoda would say, disconnection itself creates the conflict. So disconnection from yourself, Disconnection from other people. Treating people as if they're not part of your family is what causes the conflict. So creating peace requires stilling the conflict. And in this case, it means also stilling the conflict where you have the most control, and that is in yourself. First, before you go out and act. Now, I have to admit, I'm more down at this point in my evolution, still being kind of, even at 53, full of a little piss and vinegar. I still have uncooked seeds of anger, so as a martial artist, I'm more down with Malcolm than Martin. I, I have to admit that. You know, I haven't hit anybody off the practice floor, and I haven't gotten in any fight, but I definitely you may have noticed I come on strong verbally. And if attacked, I just usually on the level, of, what did he say? <laughs> huh? I see him first hand. What? I'm speaking English. English is my first language. How do you expect me to speak? Get 98 percentile on the GRE. That means only 2% of the people <laughs> in the United States speak or read better than I do. So, sorry. So, the illusion, the conflict is caused by the illusion of separation. So, Einstein, I actually sent this off to somebody. This is only half of the quote. Many people didn't know that Einstein is a, was a fervent anti-racist. Way fervent. Radical. Most people only hear about the EMC equals MC squared part, but he was a fervent anti-racist. This is the answer to a question asked by a rabbi when his daughter experienced some anti-Semitism and racism. This is the answer Einstein gives. A human being is part of the whole, called by us the universe, limited in time and space, that is, the human being. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a prison, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons close to us.
Our task must be to free ourselves from our prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all humanity and the whole of nature in its beauty. Nobody's able to achieve this completely, but the striving for such achievement is in itself part of the liberation and a foundation for inner security. So, satyagraha as national security. From a genius. So, how you do this, self-mastery and then action in the world. But, of course, you don't wait for the action, you, the self-mastery. It's a process, not a destination. Okay? So you continually work on yourself and action in the world. So from the instructions, Ahab la will babai kun, basically the image, uh, basically in Aramaic, so this is uh, one of the instructions about how you begin to love your enemy. So first, the word used for love, aheb, refers to, in Aramaic, a mysterious transpersonal force that is beyond the person, but still within the person, okay, that brings things together in secret to create new life. Okay? So neither agape or eros, it's something beyond that. So the word, the word for supreme being in Aramaic is alaha, which means sacred unity, the one before whom there are no others. Okay? And the reason it's sacred unity is because another word, satana, see, remember, he's part of the nation of Israel, quote, unquote, a Jew, right? Jews still don't believe in a devil, or a hell. Didn't then. Wasn't in the original teachings. Satana literally means adversary or that which distracts us from the unity, from Allaha. Okay? So it actually is semantically equivalent to your own little ego. Okay? In Arabic they would say uh, your nafs, your ego. Your nafs is that which keeps you from Islam, submission to the will of Allah. And of course, one who submits to the will of Allah, that is, greater will than your little nafs, is a Muslim. Okay? Same concept, related concepts because they're related languages. All right? So, satana means your ego, not some evil archangel on earth or in hell, which they don't believe in, because if there was one, then God wouldn't be supreme. And so the supreme being is sacred unity. Okay? And satana is that which distracts you. So your enemy is still part of Allaha. Okay? What separates them is one or both of you have fallen out of rhythm with sacred unity. Okay? So if you're using a Taoist Buddhist connection, when two rocks hit, <laughs> sparks fly. <laughs> Two hard egos, <laughs> okay? What does martial arts teach us? You got to become like water. Water will wear down rocks without being harmed by the rock. <sighs> okay, so that's a quality where you <sighs> achieve a greater unity. And how do you do that? Bring yourself back into rhythm within, okay? Your enemy has fallen out of rhythm with sacred unity and with you. So you don't bring yourself out of rhythm, you bring yourself back into rhythm. Okay? And that means, in order to do that, the word for Holy Spirit in Aramaic is ruach, which means breath. So that means, for example, in martial arts we know, mind follows the breath. Slow the breath, control the mind. As one of my teachers Yogi Bhajan says, okay, you want mastery? Breathe once a minute. Okay, normally you breathe 15 breaths a minute. If you're agitated, sexually aroused, it goes up to 24 to 31. Okay, there are certain pranayamic exercises. There's one I teach called, which is not within Kundalini Yoga, but it's the, uh, what I call the two to one resonance breath. Take one breath, inhale, 
to a count of five, five seconds. Exhale to a count of 10, 15 cycle, cycle breath. That's four a minute. Do that for two and a half minutes. You'll experience a change in consciousness. Goal is, of course, one breath a minute. Try it. You definitely, OK? Can be done. Can be done. Okay. There are certain kriyas and exercises that we learn in Kundalini Yoga that teach that, you know, and other forms of yoga, too. It's not impossible. All right. Bring yourself back into rhythm within. Find the movement that mates with theirs like two lovers creating new life from dust. Do this in secret so they don't know. This kind of love creates. It doesn't emote. So it's like beyond the person. It's not about you know, erotic love or brotherly love. It's beyond the personal. Bringing opposites together in secret to create new life. So you're not, necess you're not even engaging with the enemy. Okay? You're bringing yourself back into rhythm. And when you do that, in order, you know, if you're going to look at this yogically, practically, okay, in order to see into your enemy's heart, you have to still your own heart first to the level where you and they are the same being. Once you do that, you can see what they're missing and fill it in yourself. You don't even deal with them. Fill it in yourself. Fill it or feel it. As we say in reggae, who knows it, feels it. Yeah. Is this a quote from the Bible? This is actually, yeah. Well, the phrase in, Arama in Aramaic that got translated into love your enemies in Luke. Okay? It just got translated, love your enemies in Luke. Okay? But in Aramaic, there's like it's a bit more poetic. Uh, not only a bit more poetic, it's like instructions on how to do it. This is from Prayers of the Cosmos by Neil Douglas Klotz, who's an Aramaic scholar who basically, you know, trans the Prayers of the Cosmos is a line-by-line -line translation of the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, plus the Beatitudes, plus phrases like, love your enemies. And in a line-by-line -line translation of the Lord's Prayer, one, first, uh, let's see, Abun de Bwashmaya, the first Lord, the first line, Abwun literally means birther. Okay, so not our father, birther. Uh, unless biology has changed in 2,000 years. Okay, how do you get birther from our father from birther? Well, you don't. Okay, in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, she talks about, okay, the Trinity, what the Holy Trinity is. Left side, your feminine side. Right side, your masculine side. Male and female come together to create the child of true humanity. Okay? You have to bring your polarities together to create a new unity, and that unity is the child of true humanity. So, yo, know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, where's Mama? So, anytime Mama gets taken out, somebody's fooling around for some reason. So, sadhigraha, holding on to truth. Its root meaning is holding on to truth, hence truth force. I've also called it love force or soul force. In the application of sadhigraha, I discovered in the earliest stages that pursuit of truth did not admit of violence being inflicted on one's opponent, but the opponent must be weaned from error by patience and sympathy. For what appears to be truth to the one may appear to be error to the other. So it means, oh, you might think that they're in error, but you might be in error. Yeah, got it. Thanks. What appears to be truth to one might be error to the other. And patience means self-suffering, not meaning that you suffer, but one of the things you're suffering is <laughs> yourself. You've got to let go of your limited view and work with your stuff to a greater unity. So the doctrine came to mean vindication of truth, not by infliction of suffering on the opponent, but on oneself. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the 
last words on the cross were not, why have you forsaken me, but for this I was kept. Mastery, not weakness, mastery. So what do they do? Lynching, social structural violence, disproportionality. For example, alcohol and drugs. I'm Lane's drug counselor, so one of the things I look at is addictions. Alcohol and drugs kill more black people every year than the Klan did in its entire history. That's on a close order, like 50,000 deaths from tobacco and cigarettes alone. We're 13% of this population smoke one-third of the cigarettes. Targeted marketing show gives us the most addictive and most carcinogenic cigarettes, menthol. Not an accident. Incarceration for medical problems like addiction, jail instead of treatment. Leading to our view in Sada Yigraha, addiction is slavery. And you know how we feel about slavery. I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if only they knew they were slaves. That's a quote from the General, General Harriet Tubman, Dr. Matula Shakur, Tupac's daddy. He's an acupuncturist currently incarcerated for running a free acupuncture detox heroin clinic with the Black Panthers. Nixon conspiracy laws basically tied him to a bank robbery that he had no, he had no participation in and had no prior knowledge of, and boom, well, you part of it. And like, nobody robs a bank to fund a heroin detox clinic using acupuncture. What's up with that? <laughs> Please, not even close. You were saying, how did you? Oh, I was asking what charges you. Yeah. So, damaged educational systems which damage access to legal employment. So, satyagraha means grasping the truth to the people. <clears throat> Getting the truth to the people regardless of the mainstream systems of delivering truth. So, if you notice Gandhi's strategy in South Africa and India, it basically is spreading a level of education independent of the educational system. Which, even though I'm an educator, there are certain things you've got to teach people. Generally, they will tell the they will kill the truth tellers or discredit them. So fear of a black messiah, you know, that's one of the reasons that a number of us feel that, you know, with whatever Obama's popularity, they gonna kill that nigga. Or he's gonna be corrupted by the system. I could go either way about, you know, who is, you know, I'm pulling for the brother, but I don't want him dead. So, <clears throat> Be the change you want to see the, in the world. Refresh yourself in the presence of something bigger than yourself. So when we start talking about strategies, what, we got less than five minutes? Two? Five. Five? OK. All right. So being connected. Notice where you're angry. Where have you been hurt inside? Where is there justice outside? Notice the connection. Chill or transform, not suppress. Your anger through knowledge. Seek knowledge before vengeance. So Satyagraha depends on building self-mastery. So notice who has done what you want to do. Discipline is to follow an inner teacher. Carry on a lineage with that inner teacher and notice the inner dialogue. So Tahotep, Tahotep in Egypt before Patanjali, before Moses, who was initiate of the Egyptian mystery schools, before Yeshua, before Degawanada, before Hiawatha, before Gandhi, before Thurman, before Rustin, before King. Find a lineage. Who has done what you want to do? So quickly, what they should teach in school. That supports Satyagraha. Self-knowledge, self-gnosis. A spiritual cartography. This is my limited ego, and this is my higher self. Nonviolent communication. Personal erogenous zone mapping. Conscious contraception and conception. Tantra. Psychoecology, your relationship to the natural world. Emotional hygiene. How do I clean up a dirty ego? 
And then after that, that's the internal stuff, the external stuff, balancing your life, balancing your checkbook, investing and saving, money sadhana, that is money as a spiritual discipline practice, family financial planning. It's only then okay, that you can start beginning to practice being effective in the world. You have to be personally effective before you can be politically effective. Too many times our activists are unbalanced, uncentered. They're basically creating violence because they haven't dealt with the violence in themselves. Or they're not at least working on it. So, Satyagraha is a covert operation. It's inside self-liberation through self-education leading to self-mastery. They will kill your leaders. So don't have any they can kill. Unite with your enemies from the inside, which is also part of the instructions. So I got to actually hit it for the airport, and Dean's at the end of his tape anyway. So this is a good place to stop and do Q&A.